Welcome to the Enterprise Sessions. Today, I'm talking to Dr. Zeke Steer, who's CEO and founder of Milbotics. Zeke, thank you so much for finding the time and your busy schedules to talk to me. No problem. Um, so I, I know a little bit about the Milbotics story and what, what gave rise to it, and I'm really looking forward to, to exploring that. But before we do, perhaps you could just tell us a little bit about your background and what brought you to Bristol. Absolutely, yeah. So I started my career in defense, um, originally in the area of force protection. So I was developing systems that we used to prevent roadside bombs from detonating. Uh, I then moved into um, artificial intelligence with the same company, and this was based in Tewkesbury. Uh, and there I was working with really large social media data sets, uh, exploring patterns and trying to identify significant events. And then I moved into surveillance uh, with a piece of software that was used to integrate lots of different data feeds and uh, from some really James Bond type devices. But towards the end of that, um, that job, I got itchy feet and I stopped learning in the way that I was hoping I would and really wanted to go back to university, um, you know, pursue a PhD, hopefully re-engage with learning and explore the next chapter. Uh, and that led me to the Bristol Robotics Lab, where I did my PhD, um, partnership between obviously the University of Bristol and UWE, mm -hmm. and uh, now commercialising that research. So here I am. So tell me a little bit about the PhD. What, what kind of topic did you select? Based on my personal experience with my great grandmother, who had dementia and became very aggressive, mm. um, I became you know, really motivated to try and explore a technological solution that could help people like her remain independent in the community where they often prefer to be. So I was working with the assisted living group at the Bristol Robotics Lab, mm -hmm. and they do some really exciting research, uh, you know, integrating robotics into people's daily lives to support, you know, often people that have a disability or people that are a little bit older. And my particular research focused on uh, how we could use a wearable to detect signs of a person being in distress where that person couldn't necessarily communicate that. Mm -hmm. And it went very well. And, uh, you know, obviously having had that personal experience with my great grandmother, I wanted to try and make an impact more so than I could have done by staying within academia and publishing papers. So I decided to go on that very difficult uh, commercialization route and uh, so far going pretty well. Oh, I, I'm looking forward to hearing more about that. But first of all, tell me a little bit about the technology. So inspired by your great grandmother who was struggling as, as so many people do with, with the, the awful effects of dementia. I understand that what you all ended up with was socks. That's right. Okay, yeah. so why socks? And what sorts of things can the socks detect to indicate a person might be in distress? I was very lucky through my research to be working with St. Monica Trust, mm -hmm. also based in Bristol. And an initial part of the research involved taking in different wearables into the care home and speaking to frontline care staff who you know had a lot of experience with uh, people with dementia and i kept hearing the same thing reiterated that nobody with dementia would use this they would take it off there was a particular anecdote that um, you know I've, I've told a few times now but there was this elderly gentleman who received a very expensive watch from his family and it lasted a couple of weeks before it went missing uh, eventually the staff found it down the toilet so it really highlights you know how people with dementia don't necessarily behave in logical ways. No predictable ways at all. Exactly. Uh, so through conversations with the care team, we um, you know, identified the need for an alternative wearable. And actually socks are something that everybody wears, at least in this country, a familiar item of clothing, a lot less likely to be removed than other, other, other wearables. Um, and that's where we uh, you know, are pursuing as a, as a form factor. As you say, so familiar that I guess someone's so used to it, they, they don't even notice they're wearing it. That's the idea, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. Out and, of sight, out of mind. And are the socks noticeably different? Like, is the um, technological component of them readily apparent to the wearer? Currently they are, because mm. we're at a prototype phase. Yeah. But obviously, as we further develop the technology, the idea is that we will be miniaturizing the electronics, uh, making them look and feel just like a regular pair of socks and also ensuring that they can be washed like a regular pair of socks, which is really important. Mm, absolutely. And then, so we've you've got a person who, I mean, from my observations of people's dementia, the distress can come on gradually or it can come on really quite abruptly um, and can manifest in different ways. So what, what could the socks tell you? What are the socks detecting? We're looking for physiological markers of stress. Mm -hmm. 
uh, principally through the person's sweat response, but also through heart rate, mm -hmm. movement, skin temperature. And the real innovation isn't actually in the hardware, it's in the, the algorithms that sit mm -hmm. on top of that data, process it and generate an alert. So we're trying to alert carers to these signs of distress about 30 minutes before an episode occurs to give the carer time to intervene, provide what might be a relatively light touch form of support, like a painkiller, for example, and avoid that escalation in behavior, which obviously has quite negative consequences yeah, in, in yeah. many cases. For themselves and for potentially people around people them around as well. Them, yeah, so that sort of early detection, intervention, prevention. Precisely. Sort of approach. Yeah. It sounds like you've been um, primarily sort of grant-based so far. Do you plan to attract investment from venture capitalists or angels, or is that not something on your on your game plan? No, we have been successful with grants, and actually, due to that success, we need to match the grants, so yeah. we have to seek investment. Uh, we're literally just on the cusp of closing two hundred and fifty thousand pounds in investment. Okay. Um, that's only half of what we need there, mm -hmm. so we are going out and seeking another two hundred and fifty k. Uh, and we will be launching a crowdfunding um, campaign imminently. So do watch out for that. That's that's very exciting. I've done yes. some crowdfunding and it was, of all of the investment raising I've done, probably the most fun and okay. the most exciting. Also the most scary in some ways, because you're not quite sure what's going to happen, but I wish you every success with that. Thank you very much. Um, so if you were to look forward, I mean, you choose the time frame: two years, five years, 10 years. If you were to look forward, what do you want to have achieved? What would you feel satisfied in terms of a, an achievement point in a few years' time? I think in the short term, obviously, I want to get a product to market. I want to see people using that and getting value from it. Um, looking a little bit further ahead, uh, I, I still have a lot to learn, mm -hmm. and I want to take that product overseas and understand some of the challenges um, associated with that. So, you know, really rounding out my experience of building a business. Maybe within five years or so, I'll be looking towards an exit, hopefully, mm -hmm. if things have gone well. And thinking about the next phase of my entrepreneurial journey. And I've already had a few thoughts. I won't share them now. No. But uh, yeah, there will be a new chapter, hopefully, and uh, more exciting stuff to come. And what I find interesting in your answer, and I won't ask you to disclose anything that you don't want to, but is that despite the hard work and the struggles and the feeling like you're doing three PhD simultaneously, I think you're saying you'd do it all again? I absolutely would, yeah. I mean, there's no more rewarding uh, experience than taking something that you've been working on for many years and ultimately bringing it to people that are going to benefit. So, And that's... something that's so, your motivations are so personal and so profound to you as well. Exactly, yeah. It's, it's having that tangible, you know, awareness of what this could do for somebody and actually being part of the, the journey towards bringing that to life. It's hugely satisfying. So knowing what you know now, if you were to advise the Zeke of a few years ago, maybe prior to the PhD, but maybe just at the point you were starting to feel you weren't learning in the way you wanted to in your, in your job, what advice would you give your younger self? I would have said don't hesitate because I was quite dissatisfied at work for some time. Uh, I was toying with starting a business, but I didn't really have the confidence, the, the knowledge that I needed to do that. Uh, and obviously then I suppose one of the confidence building activities I did was to pursue the PhD mm -hmm. so that I felt more comfortable in having something that I could take forward. But retrospectively, you know, perhaps I could have started that journey sooner. And with it being such hard work, I would have benefited from being a few years younger mm -hmm. uh, go, going on that journey. So, yeah, my, my advice to other people would be don't hesitate, do it, um, capitalize on the amazing resources that we have here in Bristol and the support and uh, yeah you'll be successful. So knowing how you came into this and how strongly you felt about what you're trying to achieve what would you like to be the legacy of Millbotics? What would you like to have fundamentally changed? I think certainly within the care sector attitudes are changing towards dementia but there is still a relic of you know inevitability of mm. the condition of how things will pan out. Um, I would like to think that through the technology that we're developing and the advice that we're supplying alongside, there might be some positive change towards how dementia is viewed in society. Um, and, and hopefully people with dementia will, you know, find that journey ultimately not quite so difficult. Yeah. 
And then at the end of the day, and I know a lot of that is through the interactions that they have with family, with carers. Yes. You know, if we can build the awareness of how they're feeling once they've lost the ability to communicate that, um, I'm sure there's potential to avoid unnecessary suffering. Mm. Uh, so that's really what drives me. To time and shape those interactions to be supportive to the individual, not not exacerbate any anxiety they're feeling. Very well put. Um, yeah, that's precisely it. Yeah. Yeah. That's all for this enterprise session. But join us again soon to hear more about the way our amazing staff and students are translating their enterprising ideas into real world impact. And do please click on the links if you'd like to contact the University of Bristol.